My brave lad, he sleeps in his faded coat of blue. In a lonely grave alone lies the heart that beats so true. They will find him and know him amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue. No more the blue. Welcome to War of the Rebellion, Stories of the Civil War. I am your host, Leon Mielzer, and this is a reading of the regimental history under the Maltese Cross, Antietam to Appomattox, The Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania, 1861 to 1865, Campaign's 155th Pennsylvania Regiment, narrated by the rank and file. This is episode 17, chapter 9. Scenes and Incidents of the Battle of Gettysburg Pastimes indulged in by the troops during a lulls in battle on 2nd and 3rd of July Many of regiment visit Devil's Den Confederate sharpshooters captured Cold rain sets in on night of 3rd Discomfort of troops Burial of dead and removal of wounded Confederate Army retreats on 5th of July. Sixth Army Corps, under General Sedgwick, leads advance in pursuit. Instructions from General Halleck to General Meade. Union Army's position at Gettysburg Defensive. Congress votes thanks of a nation to General Meade. Brilliant charge of General Farnsworth's Brigade of Cavalry. Regiment of New York State Militia arrives at Gettysburg. Many of 155th went into battle barefooted, feet swollen and blistered, unable to wear shoes. Colonel Allen with his regiment on Little Round Top. Field hospitals located near firing line. Casualties. Recreations in lull of battle. During the lull in the fire of the battle and the uncertainty of how soon hostilities might be renewed, and while enjoying the shelter of the immense rocks and boulders of Little Round Top from the fierce artillery duel from the 140 Confederate guns, lasting over an hour in the afternoon of the 2nd, and also from the terrific bombardment on the 3rd day of July, many of the men occupied themselves with very pacific pastimes. In some groups, so securely sheltered, cards were produced, and games of euchre were played, were enjoyed by proficients in the science of Hoyle. Others might be seen reading home newspapers, several days old. Some, too, more seriously inclined, were perusing long-neglected testaments, while not a few others thought the time and opportunity most appropriate to write letters home to parents or sweethearts. The apparent want of mail facilities, however, made it uncertain when the letters being thus written could be sent away. Some of a methodical turn were seen making entries in diaries. Whilst the irrepressible regimental artist of Company E was engaged in making snapshots of General Meade and Warren in his sketchbook, unpatriotic farmers demand pay for straw. In the cessation of the firing and during the preparations of the Confederates for renewal of the battle on the 3rd of July, the 155th and other regiments of Weed's Brigade, now commanded by Colonel Kenner Garrard, were visited in their bivouac on a strange mission by some citizen farmers residing adjacent to Little Round Top. This delegation had a grievance and the first officer they met to whom they poured out the story of their trouble was Major A.L. Pearson. With an obtuseness of the existing carnage and surrounding misery caused by the meeting of the contending armies, and before the full contest for supremacy had been decided, these phlegmatic farmers complained that the straw and hay in their barns nearby had been taken by the Union soldiers and carried away to the field hospitals for use of the wounded soldiers in the battle, and made demand for immediate payment for the same. This unseemly conduct so shocked Major Pearson 
that he gave the visiting farmers a stinging rebuke, and, in stern language, denounced their want of patriotism and their inhumanity in terms so strong that it must have penetrated the dense stupidity of the claimants. Major Pearson ordered the committee of farmers to leave Little Round Top, threatening that if they did not do so at once he would take the 155th Regiment and destroy their barns and have their owners court-martialed for their disloyalty as well as their inhumanity. The next day, other farmers visited the field hospitals where amputations of the wounded and burials of the dead were taking place, and with these spectacles before their eyes repeated their inhumane demands to the surgeons in charge to be paid for the straw and hay thus used for the wounded. The dense ignorance of these peasants and their want of knowledge of the great war, its causes or objects and their unconcern and total want of public spirit, is the most charitable explanation of their action on this occasion. It is by no means intended to brand all the resident farmers of this vicinity as wanting in humanity or patriotism by reason of the shameful actions of the visitors mentioned, who, as stated before the echoes of the cannonading at Little Round Top, had died out, were demanding pay for the hay and straw required for the wounded soldiers. These were no doubt exceptional instances, and, in marked contrast with many acts of kindness and public spirit shown the Union soldiers by the general population of the locality during the Gettysburg Campaign. As a reflex from the repulse of Pickett's great charge on the left center of the Union line, the Confederates, who had their skirmish line and sharpshooters in and about the Devil's Den, withdrew them and their immediate supports on straightening their lines under the Confederate general law a considerable distance back from their previous advance. And falling back to reform their lines on the left, the Confederates abandoned many of their wounded sharpshooters who had been concealed in Devil's Den, and when the Union skirmish line and pickets advanced, they found squads of Confederate soldiers, as well as many of their wounded, abandoned. Many Confederates were thus promptly captured, and still more surrendered without question. Quite a number who were badly wounded, came through the advanced Union picket line in front of the 155th, as the firing had ceased many of the 155th, and of other regiments of Wheat's brigade availed themselves of the lull in the battle, and of the enemies falling back half a mile or more to reform their lines, to go over the rocks and points fronting the scene of such veer fighting on the second. Among the officers who thus availed themselves of the enemy's falling back and yielding up possession of the intervening ground was Lieutenant George M. Loglin of Company E and Lieutenant D. E. Lyon of Company H. These officers had heard of the death and battle of Sergeant David R. Akison of the 140th Pennsylvania, who had been their classmate in Washington College. The officers named found the position of the 140th and evidences of the terrible fighting under sickles in the peach orchard and of the losses sustained by the sight of the number of unburied bodies of the slain. They were unable, however, to find the body of their missing classmate, their search being interrupted by the opening of the firing of the enemy, to whose lines these officers had unwittingly approached too close. On a huge boulder in the peach orchard is carved and visible today the name David R. Atchison. 140th Pennsylvania, to mark the identical spot where this brave soldier fell. The redoubtable James Finnegan of Company D also took advantage of this peaceful situation to visit the hill slope and valley below, including Devil's Den, which was now within the Union lines. Finnegan was unarmed and being quite small in stature, his ordinary appearance was not such as would tend to terrify the ordinary Confederate soldier. He had no other business in that portion of the field than mere curiosity to see the dead and wounded. As he entered the huge rocks of Devil's Den, not less than four stalwart Georgian sharpshooters concealed in the rocks, noticing that Finnegan was unarmed, threw away their guns and called to him that they desired to surrender, as the Confederates had fallen back half a mile, leaving them to be captured. Finnegan accepted their surrender unconditionally and proudly marched his prisoners up Little Round Top to the lines of the 155th, 
where with great pride he reported his achievement to Major Montooth, adjutant of the regiment, an answer to the question of how he came to capture so many Confederates. Finnegan triumphantly replied, Begora, I surrounded him. Corporal Frank Gilmore of Company A, during the cessation of hostilities, also ventured down among the rocks very close to the enemy's new line in front of the Bucktail and Burdan sharpshooters were already on duty with the Union advance line. Gilmore found a Confederate concealed among the rocks who surrendered to him, and he brought his captive to the regimental line, turning him over to Adjutant Montooth. The prisoner was suffering from a bullet wound in the jaw and requiring medical attention was set under guard to the field hospital for treatment. It was not long this day after the evacuation of Devil's Den till hundreds of the Union troops unarmed were permitted to leave their positions and to visit between the lines, some to help succor the wounded, others to witness the fearful sights of the battlefield of the previous two days, whilst still others got clothing and shoes, ammunition and guns no longer useful to the army of the dead, who remained for the time unburied. Curiosities of Artillery Contest Humane Incidents Among the curiosities of the cannonading at Gettysburg were several remarkable instances where the enemy's solid shot struck and penetrated a Union cannon squarely in the muzzle, in some cases cracking or bursting the gun thus struck, and in other cases the solid shot lodging like a plug solidly wedged in the mouth of the cannon. Conspicuous instances of the humane feeling pervading the soldiers of either army so soon after the cessation of deadly firing and almost before the echoes of the musketry volleys had died out was observable at Gettysburg. Particularly noticeable was the reception of a few of the badly wounded Confederate sharpshooters who came into the picket line in front of the 155th to whom these Confederates surrendered. Some were badly wounded in the jaw and face interfering with their ability to eat the extremely hard oatmeal bread forming the ration of the Confederates. Recognizing the situation and the hunger of the prisoners, Private William P. Ketchum, of Company F, took from his haversack a fresh loaf of soft bread, which he had received in the morning of the 2nd of July before the battle, and insisted on a prisoner, whose teeth had been knocked out, taking the soft bread in exchange for the latter's very hard hardtack. Other 155th pickets divided their rations at this outpost with the hungry Confederates, and exhibiting mercy and humanity, most exemplary and chivalrous to vanquished foes. Cessation of Hostilities, July 4th As is usual, after very heavy bombardments, a heavy cold rain set in on the night of the 3rd, continuing until morning. Much chilliness on the bleak rocks and stone bedding was felt by the soldiers thus exposed. The knowledge, however, that the summing up of the day's fighting along the line had resulted in a victory for the Union arms cheered the spirits and hopes of all the troops, so that they soon fell into a refreshing sleep, being undisturbed from war's alarms through the night. The choice of positions on the rocks for beds and quarters during this night was quite animated. Those who had retired early and secured spots beneath the friendly boulders which had sheltered them so generously during the bombardment found the same objects of little use against the elements pouring down from the canopy above. Pools of water and dugout caves, which had served the day before as bomb-proofs, now made these quarters very undesirable. Upper stories on ledges and rocks were preferable although their slope and shapes made them somewhat uncomfortable to the wearied soldier. A veteran, however, becomes used to all positions and accommodations, and with thanks that the enemy did not, during the night, contribute to their discomfort by reopening the batteries or making other disturbing movements the Union soldiers, slept soundly until the reveille sounded in the morning of the glorious 4th of July. It was a most cheerless day, so far as the prevailing chilliness and drizzling rain, and annoyance attended upon attempting to cook coffee and prepare meals from the soldiers' rations could make it so. 
their hardtack had become saturated with water, and swollen, and fires to cook or warm food were difficult to make things. Were difficult to make because of the prevailing rain and wet conditions. For this unsatisfactory state of things, consolation was obtained by the agreeable disappointment that the enemy, whose lines were still visible, occupying every position of the day previous, had not resumed hostilities except by desultory picket firing at points distant from Little Round Top and the position of the 155th. As the day progressed, this feeling of gladness at the enemy's cessation of hostilities increased, and the day was spent quietly by the troops resting from the unusual labors of the previous three days. Stretcher bearers, ambulances, and many of the troops were detailed in burial parties to visit the grounds and bury the thousands of dead of both armies remaining on the field, and to remove the large number of wounded of both armies to the field hospitals which had been established near the battle line. This burial of the dead was one of the saddest features of the bloody struggle, many of the bodies having lain on the field for two and three days beneath the scorching rays of a July sun, were so distorted and swollen as to be beyond recognition. Teamsters and supply trains were also kept extremely busy, bringing up and distributing rations to the soldiers, and hospitals as well as forage for the animals. The heavy demands of the battle which had exhausted the supply of artillery and infantry ammunition had to be met, and the same required replenishment before any movement of the army could be renewed. Consequently, the teams of the ammunition train, drivers, and guards were kept busy on that duty all of the 4th of July. The Confederates engaged in retreating had no such difficulties to contend against as had General Meade. They left their dead and wounded, as well as the several thousand prisoners, to the humanity of the Union Army, and continued their foraging off the country for their supplies. Having half a dozen excellent roads on which to conduct their retreat from Gettysburg to the Potomac, the preparations described as well as the conditions existing on the battlefield occupied every moment of the time and attention of General Meade and his surviving generals on the fourth day of July. Retreat of Lee's Army and Pursuit Early on the morning of the 5th of July, it was discovered that the Confederate Army had, during the night, withdrawn their skirmishers from the line occupied by them up to nightfall of July 4th. General Meade at once directed General Pleasanton immediately to send the cavalry divisions of Gregg, Buford, and Custer in pursuit of the enemy. General Meade also set in motion the 6th Army Corps under General Sedgwick, 20,000 infantry, to pursue the retreating Confederates. The other corps of the army speedily followed in pursuit by different routes, but the Confederates had a full night's advantage in leading the retreat, and Stuart's cavalry, the rear guard of Lee's columns, covered the retreat of the miles of wagon and ammunition trains, holding at bay Pleasanton's cavalry, until the Confederate trains had time to make good their escape. Another phase peculiar to the Gettysburg campaign after the battle had ended was the fact that in every company there were at least several men who, by reason of the excessive forced marches, had their feet so blistered that they could not wear shoes, and many were seen on the last days of the campaign preceding the battle with their shoes strung across their muskets as they marched in the ranks barefooted. A number of these men throughout the army, who were unable by reason of their exhausted condition and further injury to their feet in going in on the rocky heights and positions to battle, were rendered unfit for further marching and therefore could not take part in the pursuit. They were sent by orders of the surgeon in a large number of cases to the field hospitals in Gettysburg there to abide until their suffering feet were restored sufficiently again to wear shoes. It is supposed that at a low estimate upwards of 2,000 of Meade's men were thus excused from the ranks on the renewal of marching. If, on the sunrise and reveille of the 4th of July, so bleak, so chilly and so miserable, with its sorrowful associations, there was any officer or enlisted man in Weed's brigade, 
then holding position on Little Round Top, who was eager for a resumption of the battle and anxious for renewing the fray. He kept it so secret and subdued that it never reached the masses of the troops defending that important position. The anxiety for battle and thirst for gore, and terms so freely used by descriptive writers, belongs to the domain of fiction and describes a sentiment far from the truth. Braver officers and men than those who withstood the continued bombardment and the desperate fighting and charges of the Confederates at Gettysburg never existed, and all would have obeyed orders instantly to resume the battle and to die as so many of their comrades had in defense of their flag and country. Halleck's Instructions to Meade which we will pick up next week. <laughs> I love doing that to you guys. I don't think I have a whole lot to talk about here for this episode. I believe that the written portion of this chapter holds it up quite well on its own. I think I'll leave it here for this episode. We will finish this chapter up next week, my friends. Like, comment, and subscribe. Either on the podcast host of your choice or visit my website at rebellionstories.com you can also email me at war of the rebellion at gmail. Stay safe. They will find him and know him amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue. No more the bugle calls the weary one. Rest noble spirit. In thy grave alone, they will find you and know you amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue, he cried, Give me water and just one little crumb, and my mother, she will bless you through all the years to come. Go tell my sweet sister, so gentle, good, and true, that I'll meet her up in heaven or in my faded coat of blue. No more the bugle calls the weary one. Rest, noble spirit, in thy grave alone. They will find you and know you among good and true, when a robe of white is given for that faded gold of